Acts 2, 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were de devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking uh, Galileans? And then how is it we hear each of us in our own native language? Uh, Parthians, Medes, Edomites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cabot, Dosia, I'm not sure I'm saying them right, Pontus in Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of the Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Oh. But, <clears throat> but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is, not only, nine, it, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show uh, <clears throat> portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Thank you, Joanne. I appreciate you leading us in that way. And now you see why I asked a dear sister to read that passage so that I did not have to stumble through those names. Uh, it is a blessing. Uh, I know that it's a hard thing to read, uh, but to be reminded of God's work through all people groups. And we hear that in a special way uh, through this passage. So Joanne, thank you for that. And I promise that if you volunteer to read in the future, uh, you will not necessarily be forced with such a list of names. Will you pray with me? A oh, holy God, we remember this story of your spirit's coming and we yearn to encounter your spirit as those first disciples did. God, would you meet us in our fear? Would you transform us by your spirit? And would you send us to do the hard work of being your disciple? We thank you, Lord, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. So Connie and I have an interesting relationship. Let's see if she's paying attention. She provokes me to destroy her eardrums by singing. For those of you have, who have heard my attempts to, can you even call it singing? You know just how painful that can be. One of the things that, we'll, that we will occasionally sing at each other are songs from the musical Les Miserables. I never say it right. Particularly the recent film adaptation. Connie thinks that my voice is a good match for Russell Crowe's singing. As I have sat with the story of Pentecost and the story of where our world is right now, one of these songs came to mind. The song is called ABC Cafe, and it's set as one of the characters, Marius, who sadly is not played by my singing buddy, Russell Crowe, as Marius is trying to decide if he will fight with his French rebel friends or if he will follow the love of his life, Cosette, that he met like. I don't know, five minutes prior. The sung internal monologue highlights his struggle with which narrative, which story, which imagery will he believe? Will it be his fight against the powers 
Red, the blood of angry men. Black, the dark of ages past. Red, a world about to dawn. Black, the night that ends at last. And that is all the torture I will dole out today. Or will it be his burgeoning love interest? Red, I feel my soul on fire. Black, my world if she's not there. Red, the color of desire. Black, the color of despair. Does his blood flow red with anger and rebellion or with love and passion? Spoiler alert, if you have not read or heard or seen the story, he decides that his loyalties lie with his friends and with the rebellion. And he ends up joining a losing cause, nearly sacrificing his life for it all. I say all that to name a point that I bet many of us feel today as we hear God's word read. We hear the story of that first Pentecost. We hear fire come down. Does it represent the Holy Spirit of God? Or the anger that has burned in our cities these past few nights? We hear the rush of wind. Is it the Spirit of God filling us with life? Or is it the final breath of a life ended evilly? Think about what that first Pentecost must have been like. The disciples are still obeying the command of Jesus to wait when all of a sudden, Scripture tells us, a sound like the rush of a violent wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. What does that sound like to you? To me, it sounds like a tornado. After all, how do people describe tornadoes today? A freight train. I don't think the people of Jesus' time had that as a reference point. And so if you don't have freight train as a reference, you're just going to have to call it what it is, a violent wind. Put yourself in their shoes. <laughs> Some of us can. Kelly and Kale and all the Braxton family. While they had a little bit of warning from our modern technolo technological friends, they, along with their neighbors, were awoken on Easter Monday by such a horrific sound. Many who live there watch their homes crumble away at the hands of this violent wind. This isn't something unique to today. The ancients knew the terrible power of wind. The disciples were faithfully waiting for the Spirit, and God met them in the roar of a violent wind. God began the movement of the church in what had to be one of the most horrific moments of these men's lives. Does this wind bring destruction and death or the life-giving spirit of God? The horror continued. In the midst of this roaring wind, what seemed to be fire fell down upon each disciple. We, reading today, we know the story. We know that the fire here is of God. After all, this is why the emblem of the United Methodist Church has what beside the cross? A flame to represent the Spirit of God. But again, put yourself in these disciples' shoes. You're inside, and it sounds like the building is about to be obliterated by wind with you there inside of it. As you fear for your life, you see fire come down on you. Don't you think those men just knew? that their life was at its end? Again, most of us know this story. We know that these are only introductory words. We know that the very Spirit of God is about to change these men's lives and the world. But they did not. All they knew in these opening moments of the opening minutes of the church of God, all they knew was that they were about to die. In that moment, I can almost guarantee that everything they knew, everything that they had learned, all the experiences they had, all they knew about God and Jesus and the promise of the Spirit was put away, and only the most basic human fear of death was at the forefront. We can't skip over these first three verses. For these first disciples, Pentecost began in 
horror. We are in horror now, and we can't just skip over it. After months of being saturated with the news of COVID-19, many of us are already frustrated and living on edge. And another specter has reared its head. A demon undaunted by our own, by other challenges and triumphs, a shadow always lurking within our society. Anti-blackness. As with the first Pentecost, we can't move on from the sphere. Pause just for a moment with me. Try to quiet your mind. Don't think about what a politician or a pundit has said or done. Don't think about what your experiences and opinions and pol of policing and politics are. Just for a moment, don't think about who's right or who's wrong, or even what we need to do going forward. Instead, think about what it's like to be a black person today. Think about what it's been like in the last week to have seen someone who looks like you attacked by someone who looks like me and killed. Killed for passing a counterfeit bill and resisting. Another killed for trespassing. Another killed for selling cigarettes. Another killed for looking suspicious. You never know what small crime you might commit that would earn someone like me a ticket at worst. You might just be deemed suspicious, threatening. You never know when some civilian or police officer will decide to take the law in their hands at the cost of your life, becoming judge and executioner. Have you watched the video of George Floyd in Minneapolis? Have you watched him cry for help? Have you seen the officer remain there on his neck, defiantly, as he slowly stopped moving? Things like this keep happening. Things don't seem to be changing. Imagine what it's like to be Black this Pentecost morning in America. Imagine the fear, imagine the anger, imagine the fatigue. Of course, though, the fear is spread. We're blessed to live out in Alamance County where it's been peaceful, but think what it's like to be in the cities in the midst of protest right now. To be a shop owner, maybe even a shop owner who has done everything you can to treat people with dignity. Think about the story, I don't know, maybe you saw it of the firefighter who had put his life savings into opening a bar in Minneapolis only for rioters to burn it down. Think about all the law enforcement officers, most of whom are faithful public servants, enduring vitriol and abuse, risking their lives right now to protect property and order. Think about the community leaders who see the progress in their cities burning away. Fear and anger and loss burns there this Pentecost as well. The scriptures show us so clearly that we are not the first people to face fear. It was at the height of the disciples' fear when they were probably the most scared they had ever been in their lives. Faced with terrifying wind and fire falling down upon them, it was in that moment that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking other languages. We read the story of Pentecost and we see that God met these first disciples in their fear. and began something new. God began in that place of fear and pain, of desperation. God began there and transformed it 
into the mighty work that we see that became the church. As I studied this passage over these past few days, I saw something new in this passage. It's one that gets preached every year, uh, one that you think you know. I've always thought of the gift of tongues in relation to how the gathered people describe it. As Joanne read, that's a big chunk of what the scripture is, is the, the excitement, the exhalation in all of these different people groups, hearing the word of God proclaimed so that they could hear it in the language that was spoken in their heart. This is one of those lines. How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? I've thought about it as a miracle of hearing. God's servants spoke much like normal, and God empowered the masses to hear them in their mother tongue. But that quote's just an example of how the crowds are describing their experience. To them, that's what's happening. But note earlier how the miracle is described. All of the disciples, scripture tells us, began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. In the midst of a horrific situation, God, the Holy Spirit, equipped the disciples to speak so that the nations could understand. You see, in the disciples' fear, God developed these disciples into boundary-crossing conversation. Think about what it takes to learn a language. When I was a kid, for some reason, I have this image of me walking through a grocery store and thinking about how language was just a code. I remember thinking that if I wanted to say something in Spanish, I just had to translate words one letter at a time, kind of like a cipher. It, if it was a Q in English, well, maybe then it became a B in Spanish. If it was an E in English, maybe an I. In my mind, you could speak another language if you just took long enough to learn and to use this mystical code that must have been out there somewhere. I think most of us know how silly that is. If you've ever tried to learn a language, it's a lot more than a code. Except in Pig Latin, translation is much more than just switching some letters around. You can't even fully do the work of translation with a dictionary. The deeper meanings of the words and their connotations require an intimacy with the people and the culture that a textbook just can't give you. That's how even with all of the technology that we have, the amazing things that technology can do, you can always see when you're reading a computer translation. The heart connection with the people, the connection that can illumine the nuances of what's said or spoken. Through technology, that's just lacking. And this, the power of language, the power of connection to people of every background and heritage, this is how God began the church. Nece necessarily, the church began through crossing difference. God moves so mightily in these disciples that as you can see later in this chapter, thousands accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how powerful their ability to speak in another language, to know the heart of another was. Having endured the horror that began in Pentecost, the disciples received the power of the Spirit and were used to change the world, to begin to undo the divisions that, that formed at Babel. God met these men in their terror, and God transformed it. Well, I bet most of us are not as scared as the disciples must have been in the face of wind and fire. We still feel some measure of fear today, don't we? If not personal fear, fear for those we love. We're scared of the effects of the virus. We're scared for our safety. We're scared for the safety of others. Just as on that Pentecost, God knows our fear 
and God meets us in our fear. Not only is God with us, though, notice that it was at the height of fear that God equipped and God sent the disciples. How is God equipping and sending you today? The world would tell us that we need to pick a side. One of the sides of these protests is right, one is wrong. One is good, one is evil. But remember, God calls his disciples to speak in other languages, to know the hearts of those around them. As Paul says in Romans, to weep with those who weep. Will you look for how God is equipping you to speak with those who speak a completely different language than you, whose culture and views and fears and anger vary wildly from your own and embody God's love? Sometimes we might all be speaking English, but we need the work of the Holy Spirit to transform us to be able to speak to one another. In the face of fear, will you cross boundaries through the power of the Holy Spirit? As Peter stood before the crowd to offer the church's first sermon, he quoted from the prophet Joel. In doing so, he identified the work of Pentecost as a harbinger of the final act of God to redeem the world. God's work that we are a part of today. He spoke about the signs and horrors that we often think about with the apocalypse. Blood, fire, mist, darkness. But before all that, he recited the promise that God would pour his spirit out upon all flesh. Young, old, men, women, slave, free. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We've seen how broken the world is this week, haven't we? We've seen how black folks still face mortal danger in so many circumstances. We've seen how grief and anger can be manipulated into violence and destruction. We've seen how sin has broken God's perfect design and even God's will for the church. Nevertheless, my brothers and my sisters, today is Pentecost. Today is the day when we remember that God is still with us, that God gives us the spirit, that God changes the world through us. This is the day we remember how the Spirit first met the disciples in violent wind and falling fire. This is the day that we remember the first disciples who were mobilized out of their fear into conversation and mission to the whole world. This is the day that we must answer that same call still today to know the pain of our neighbors well enough to speak the gospel of Christ around the lines that divide us. This is the day to listen to the hurting, to learn, and to offer the compassion and love of Christ, and to work to establish a world without this sort of evil, without this sort of pain. I wear red today. Maybe you do too. Like Marius, it's worth asking what our red stands for. Does it stand for the red of fires of destruction? Does it stand for the red of the blood of lives ended too quickly? Does it st stand for the red of the fire of God's spirit? Does it stand for the red of the color of the blood of Christ that cleanses us all. Where exactly do these colors mix? 
where is God's spirit in the world today? These days, like the first Pentecost, are scary days. Let's emulate these first disciples, ready to receive God's spirit and do the work of reconciling all people with God and all people with each other. Let us embody the healing spirit of God in a broken, hurting, and divided world. My brothers and sisters, let us be the church. Amen.